I'm pleased to be back. Uh, again, my talk is about uh, Dogen's Bendo Wa, or Endeavor of the Way. This is the second part. And uh, the first part, if you recall, there were six different chapters, if you will, of, of direct instruction. And then he followed it up with a question and answer section, which I'll uh, try to illuminate today, uh, to, that further clarifies some of the things that he says. Uh, so previously, remember that uh, the critical practice points that, that Bindo Wa makes uh, for Dogen is that Zazen is the only necessary and sufficient practice for enlightenment. And also recall that uh, he made a big deal about his concept of practice enlightenment. And that's the present moment of, in Zazen. Uh, so, um, and really the questions and answers this week really drive into what is essential or not essential. And so he's going to talk about uh, practices other than zazen, some that we do. Uh, he's going to talk about the concept of practice enlightenment a little bit more, and there are some other requirements in what he means by zazen. And then he's also going to clarify about Zazen, Zen practice, and lay people. So first of all, Zazen compared to other practices. A couple of questions ask, well, why do you recommend Zazen as the exclusive gate? And his answer very simply is, well, the, the great Shakyamuni correctly transmitted this method. And uh, all the Tathagas, past, present, and future, use Zazen. Not only that, all the ancestors in India and China relied on Zazen. And then question, the next question says, well, what about other practices? What about reading the sutras? And what about chanting the Buddha's name and that sort of thing? Certainly that must be a cause of enlightenment. And then the question says, how can Zazen just sitting uselessly and doing nothing be dependent upon for gaining enlightenment? Uh-oh, I think that question went a little too far because Dogen then lights up that question. He says, if you think the Samadhi of all Buddhas, their unsurpassable great method is just sitting uselessly and doing nothing, you'll be one who slanders the great vehicle. So, uh, and then he says, already Buddhists sit in Samadhi and Zazen. So Dogen's Zazen is not doing nothing. It's, it's very much abiding in something real. But then he goes on and he, he, in his answers, he introduces the issue of trust, having trust and faith in what? In our inherent enlightenment. And he says, now, all the realms of Buddhas are inconceivable. In other words, remember, you can't approach it by what you think, right? It cannot be reached by your consciousness or your perceptions even. Much less can those who have no trust and lack wisdom understand it. Only those who have right trust and the capacity can enter that realm of enlightenment. So, and he says, those who have no trust in their inherent enlightenment <laughs> will not accept it, no matter how much you teach them, no matter how much you yap at them, they, they won't get it because they don't have that trust. Now, Dogen's take on sutra study, he says, well, as far as studying sutras, do you understand that the merit of attained by just simply reading and reciting the sutras or Buddha's name it's hopeless to think that just moving your tongue and making a sound is meritorious Buddhist activity. But sutra study does have a purpose. He says, actually, the meaning of studying sutras is that if you understand and follow the rules of practice, you will unmistakably attain enlightenment. So it's a guide. It's not something to worship. It's a guide. It's a pointer. Uh, and he says, in studying sutras, you should not expend thoughts in the vain hope that they will somehow be helpful in attaining wisdom. In other words, I'm sort of a magical thinking type thing. If I just recite this enough uh, or copy the sutras enough, 
that this will somehow uh, have a breakthrough. He says, realization cannot be known by monks who study words. Therefore, stop your doubt. The opposite is have faith in your enlightenment. Practice us and under a correct teacher and actualize the self-fulfilling samadhi of all Buddha. Do you remember last time in my talk, I said that you, you have to be abiding in that complete samadhi absorption. Then the next question is, well, hey, the Dogen, there's a lot of other schools, the Lotus School, the Avatamsaka School, the Mantra Schools. Uh, why do you emphasize Zazen and ignore all those fine schools? Uh, and he says, you should know that in the Buddha's house, we do not discuss superiority or inferiority of the teachings. We don't concern ourselves with the depth or shallowness of the Dharma, but only with the genuineness or falseness of practice. So he doesn't get sucked into that bad bashing or bad mouthing. He says, I'm just telling you what the genuine gate is. He says, and then he says, uh, and I think this sort of applies. Sometimes you read things that are inspiring, right? He says, do not be con concerned by the splendor of the words, right? Sometimes things are, re we read something and we're really moved. And so he says, don't attach to that. Don't make that a thing. Don't make that part of your enlightenment scheme or program or to-do list. <laughs> and he says, scholars who count letters can't, can't get there. It's like the blind leading the blind. He says also, and then he repeats this, you should know we do not originally lack unsurpassed enlightenment. It is, it is inherently in everywhere, and we are enriched with it always. But because we can't accept it, see, there's that faith thing again, and we tend to create groundless views regarding them as actual things, that way we miss the great way, and our efforts are fruitless. Because of these views, illusory flowers bloom in various ways. So basically, he's saying, don't take what you read in a sutra and make it sort of a shiny object of your attachment. I think that'd be the best way to put it. He says, you know, otherwise you're all worried about the 12 fold causation of rebirth or the 25 existences or views about the three vehicles or views about the five vehicles or Buddha's about views about Buddha existing or not existing. He says, that's a distraction. That's not necessary or sufficient. He says, instead, instead just sit zazen wholeheartedly, forming the Buddha seal and letting everything else go. Then you'll go beyond concepts of delusion or, or enlightenment. You'll go beyond that dualism. And you'll wander freely outside of ordinary thinking. Because remember, our ordinary thoughts, even the most sophisticated thoughts, can't describe enlightenment. Now later, he tries to outwit, a monk or a question tries to outwit Dogen. And he, the question is, hey, you know, Dogen, there's been Zen stories where, you know, a monk was sweeping and a pebble hits the, a bamboo and the sound made him enlightened. Or there's another one where somebody saw uh, blossom petals. And, said, and what about the Buddha seeing the morning star or Ananda when the debate flag was knocked down? Well, weren't they, did they get an enlightenment? They weren't doing zazen, were they? Well, Dogen says, of those who understand, understood or had an awakening because of those stimuli, not one had any intellectual thinking regarding that, or, and they had no other self than their original self. So in other words, he doesn't dispute that people's enlightenment may have been triggered. His own enlightenment is, was when his master beat, took a sandal and beat it and startled the whole sangha because a guy next to Dogen had dozed off. But, but Dogen was doing zazen. <laughs> 
It wasn't some sort of accidental scheme. Otherwise, we'd just put on, Kate could put on a, a random uh, loud sound device, and when it went off, it would all be in light. See, we're all still here. It didn't work. <laughs> now, the second theme, of course, was Dogen's practice of enlightenment. And so uh, uh, the question, there's the first question as well, should enlightened people practice it or just novices who haven't had realization? And he's, first of all, Dogen says, to think that practice and realization are two different things is heretical. Because practice of the present moment is practice realization, the practice of beginner's mind is itself the entire original realization. Did you hear that phrase? Does that remind you of a book title by Suzuki Roshi? Hmm, the beginner's mind. And then he makes three more points about practice enlightenment. First of all, he says, when we give instruction for practicing, we say you should not have any expectation of realization outside of that practice. Since it's already the immediate original realization and there's no boundary between realization. There's no beginning of practice. Second of all, although practice is not apart from realization, we have inherited this wonderful practice. And he says again, beginner practice is individually to attain original realization. That's already there in other words. He says, Buddha ancestors have always cautioned not to slack off in your practice. So that goes back to the question of, should enlightened people keep practicing? They're only, only just novices. Third of all, and again, remember my talk before, he, he appealed to authority of Song China, of the Zen masters in Southern China. And so he does it again in the, in the answers. He says, you know, when I was in Song China, uh, you saw 500 monks, 600 monks, 2,000 monks, all doing Zazen. And when I asked the Zen masters in China, they all said that practice and realization are not two things, not separate. They are together, practice realization. Therefore, that's why I recommend, study with a competent teacher, do Zazen in the way I've instructed here. And, uh, under, and without distinguishing between beginners or advanced students, in other words. Now the last area, if that wasn't enough encouragement for lay people, <laughs> the last section then focuses on uh, the lay practice. And uh, so the first question is interesting, I think. Should those who are already engaged in Zazen strictly follow the precepts? Remember, the monks would have taken precepts. Lay people, some of them don't, haven't taken any, not even a Roxy, right? So the answer is even those who have not yet received the precepts, which are definitely non-monks, right? Or, I love this, or even who have broken the precepts can still receive the benefit of Zazen. Lucky for us, right? <laughs> Lucky for us. So uh, he, uh, he says, uh, the ancestors say in understanding Buddha Dharma, men or women, noble or common, are not distinguished. And then another question comes up, well, monks or home, what we call home leavers, they've left the family, they're in the monastery. Home leavers are free from various involvements and do not have hindrances. How can the lay people who are all occupied with their household possibly uh, uh, have, you know, attain this enlightenment, attain this realization? Now, before I read Buddha's answer, I've been to a few Zen centers, monastery. Let me assure you, even monks do have some hindrances. You know, Roshi called on so-and-so and not me. Why was I bypassed to be Jisha, personal assistant? You know, why am I always stuck on blah, blah duty? But anyhow, Dogen was much nicer than me. He says, uh, in understanding Buddha Dharma, oops, I'm sorry, Buddha, Buddha ancestors out of their kindness have opened the wide gate of compassion in order to let 
all sentient beings enter into realization. Who among humans or heavenly beings even cannot enter? So, and then he gives a whole bunch of examples. Emperors in China practice Zazen. Uh, prime ministers of China practice Zazen. He says it, it depends on whether you have the right willingness or not. It doesn't matter whether you're a, a lay person with a household or a home leaver in a monastery. And he goes on. There, the great minister Feng in the great song is a high minister, very powerful, yet he sat Zazen most of the day. He says it only matters what your deep intention is toward the Buddha way. And then he says there were warriors, there were literary people in China. Uh, he says that, that means that worldly duties don't interfere with Zazen. And he points out even Shakyamuni when he was alive, uh, people who had committed serious crimes or were, had seriously wrong views were able to use this method and have realization. And he says, heck, even hunters and woodcutters became ancestors. So now he says, if it, if it was for them, then it's the same for all lay people. You should just seek the teaching of authentic master. In other words, not just somebody trying to push monastic practice only. Now, the final leg of his support for lay practice is the concept of right trust again, that faith or trust. And so the first question is kind of bizarre. Uh, it says, well, Dogen, you know, the people in India and China were far more advanced in med meditative med matters than us primitives here in Japan, who are fairly crude and, and are, are, don't have the cultural experience. And Dogen actually agrees. He says, what you say is correct. Uh, people in our country, you know, wisdom, that type of wisdom doesn't prevail here yet. And he says, uh, uh, you know, our, our nature is a little coarser than those countries you mentioned. And even if the correct dharma is explained, uh, it's sometimes become poisonous and perverted here. He says, even people uh, for name, for gain and uh, for fame, uh, will use this improperly. However, entering in real, realization of Buddha Dharma does not require the worldly, worldly wisdom of humans. And he says, even ignorant people with the aid of right trust will be able to be free from delusion. That's pretty categorical. I, I mean, he's, he's saying, you know, uh, he said, you know, throughout over a thousand years, Shakyamuni's Buddha's teaching has been spread through many countries. And folks, let's face it, he says, people are not necessarily sharp or intelligent there. <laughs> but with this practice, uh, uh, it, it does produce results. He says, if you practice with right trust, you will attain the way regardless of being sharp or dull-witted. He says, in fact, everybody has in abundance the correct seed of prajna already, but it rarely hits the mark and enriches us, meaning we just don't realize it. And then Dogen gives uh, his own summary. He says, well, I apologize for sort of this hunt and peck style of question and answer. But he says, uh, and then he talks about other zazen instruction that he's written about. And he says, I've done this to help people uh, find the correct practice and not get led astray. My own summary of this question and answer format is, you know, we think of a question and answer like, you know, during your after a Dharma talk. But it's not really clear whether all these questions were answered in one setting. It's, it's doubtful. It's probably, well, two alternatives. It's probably either uh, a compilation of questions, criticisms, or other comments, or other teachings 
that he's had to deal with in the past. And so he tries to collect it here. It's kind of like when you go to a website and uh, most of you probably uh, clicked on the FAQ page, right? The frequently asked questions <laughs> to, to get clarification, you know, to find out how to file for this or how to do that or what to expect. So that's one possibility. The other possibility is it's simply a rhetorical device that he uses as he reflected on his six sections of instruction, he thought, well, maybe I should clarify it. So neither one devalues Dogen's words. Personally, I kind of lean toward the, the latter or the combination of the two. I don't think it was in one setting. If you read the Ehe Kokoro, the record of all of his teachings or all of the recorded teachings, which is a huge thick book, he often uses this style He'll give instruction, and then usually he asks a really mind-bending question to which no monk can answer, and then he answers it himself. So in conclusion, uh, just to recap, Zazen is the only necessary and sufficient practice for enlightenment. And practice enlightenment, what he means by zazen is not just parking your butt on the cushion. It is, it is having, raising that samadhi, that absorption in the present moment, in that being time moment, moment by moment, letting go of thoughts, discursive thoughts, dualistic thoughts, Sutra study is okay insofar as it's a guide for your correct practice. Now we chant the Metta Sutta and merit may be compassionate, but it's not actually enlightenment. It may be a beneficial practice to have compassion toward others. But even that, he says, is, is not the, again, that's dualistic, like I'm giving merit to X. That's pretty clearly dualistic, right? Any distinction between monastics and lay practitioners like us is irrelevant. And finally, I must repeat, you must have faith and trust in your own inherent enlightenment already present.